to have a look back in the past and yeah, to use your retrospectives. And if you're working in self-organized teams, you um, need some values to, to think about how, how that can work. And um, they're not my ideas. So the USENIX, which is a subgroup of um, the SAGE, sage.org, um, introduced the code of ethics for sysadmins, which is um, uh, some rules, it's like 10 rules or so, to how, how you can work. And yeah, for me, it's, I got I get very into uh, tests, writing tests in a in, in, um, network environment like Nag Nagios. What is it in English? Nagios. <laughs> and yes, in this way, I like this test stuff and to, to um, stop writing every paper documentation, which is just crap. Um, this is the idea of agile development as well. Like you have just tests and that is your documentation. Um, so, and there are other ways, I, I wrote responsibility on my slide, this means like um, if, you, if you have to uh, hold the system running or the network running, I want to make the decision how that could work or uh, which uh, technical, which, 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 which technique we um, yeah, choose to, to solve the problem and I don't want to discuss quality, so this is XP as well, like um, I want to be, um, yeah, I want to be uh, um, like what I've done, so um, I want to make it secure and to make it fail-proof and make it tested and to be sure that it's, it's, um, it's okay. So um, if you're interested in stuff like this, I've re um, recorded in 2006, it's quite um, a time ago, <laughs> a podcast with uh, a friend of mine, Basti, and it's, it's in German, but it's, um, it's about extreme administrating, which was the first title, but it's, this title is sh um, not so good, okay? And um, yeah, have a look at the code of ethics from Sage. And um, I like these ideas. And I would like to find people who are interested in uh, setting up a domain, setting up a wiki, and um, yeah, collecting ideas. Thank you very much. So thanks, Marcel, for presenting us Agile Admin. Next speaker is Briggs. He talks about Energize. Um, the, the microphone is yours. OK, thanks. Welcome here. First, let me ask you a question. Can you imagine what this might be? Or why I might, might put it here? Right, we don't have so much time, so it's a scale and it's balancing two things. The data centers in the world and the Netherlands. Now, why do I balance those? They are quite comparable in CO2 footprint. Millions of tons of CO2 emissions per year. The data centers in the world are, at best estimate, 170 million tons of CO2 per year. Now. If you compare this to a country like the Netherlands, 146 million tons of CO2. Now this is a big number, right? So, I'm making three key points here. Computers use a tremendous amount of energy. We can do something about it, and this something usually pays for itself. As I said, computers use much energy. 16 million people, highly industrialized country, top 10 in gross domestic product, in the Netherlands, and all these tomato greenhouses and what have you, uses less energy than the data centers. Oops. Or in another figure, the data centers use about the same energy as all the airlines together, half of the, all the airlines together. And yes, we can do something about it. Infrastructure matters in data centers can bring us a 10 to 20% reduction in that figure. You can make the cold aisles in the data center between the racks hotter. You can use natural cooling, what we in technical terms call open a window. Um, here in the moderate climates, we can do that. Um, we can use better computers. This is what Sun and uh, IBM and so on tell us as the biggest, be uh, best solution to the problem. 
use better computers, greener, more efficient servers, gives you a 20 to 20 percent reduction overall, which is a lot. But we can do more. We can do better management. And this is not going to cost you a lot of things. It's, it's actually not costing money, it's saving money. Shutting off dead servers, servers that, that don't do anything anymore, just nobody dares to shut them off because nobody knows for sure. Okay. 10 to 25 percent reduction. Use virtualization, aggressive virtualization, 25 to 30 percent. Install capacity when you need it and not earlier. Normally you buy a server for three years. So you buy the capacity that you expect it to need in three years and then some. Now this is of course buying too much capacity too early. With virtual machines you can do this very much smoother. Gives you 10 to 20 percent reduction. So we can reduce something like 50 percent of the energy consumption in the data centers. It's good for the planet. It good, it's good for the bottom line. So for the management people, they like that. And we save money by that. So less hardware costs, less infrastructure, less running costs, very good return on investment. So let's tip the scales here. Thank you for your time. Here I quote my sources. The PDF is on the web. Um, it's, it's on the wiki and uh, probably will be published somewhere. My contact details, if you want to know more or want to discuss things, thank you. So that was clean for, for minutes, so perfect on time. Next one is Michael, and he talks about mapping. Yes, okay, everything's working. Okay, I want to pitch scalable vector graphics to you. That's an XML standard that you're probably familiar from illustrations in Wikipedia or the icons in KDE. I use it for uh, mapping election results uh, uh, on the web. So usually uh, in mainstream media, you find these election maps that are done in Flash, and Flash is proprietary, is closed, and yada, yada, yada. And um, you cannot uh, put your data in, and it's always a good idea to be in control of your tools. And so I built an uh, election atlas using scalable vector graphics, and uh, you can just view source, uh, put different data in it, and I will show you why it might be worth uh, doing this. This will work on the iPhone. Um, this will work on the $100 uh, dollar, uh, per child. And um, it even works on this Windows machine. So um, um, I wanted to show you oops. Um, I mean, this is the Conservative Party, I mean, you have seen that, but let me show you something about the Nazi Party in Germany. This is the 2002 election. You will see uh, some pockets here in Saxony, um, but it's still, I mean, the darker the colors, the higher uh, the percentage, uh, the, the higher the popularity, but we are still um, uh, far below 5%, uh, even below 3%. Now. Um, to give you some idea how this developed, um, if we look at the 2005 election, and again, NPD is the Nazi party here, and so, yeah, this is the same scale uh, we are now here up to 7% and um, we can also um, uh, try to
gain some more insights um, when we um, look at some structural data. So I will show you a map with a percentage of uh, foreigners. And again, the darker colors mean high percentage of foreigners. And I think the picture is quite clear that a xenophobic party is more popular in areas where there are no foreigners and is less popular in areas where there are a lot of foreigners. Just keep that in mind. Um, you can you can check this out. Oops, sorry. Um, there are, there's a lot of data in there already. Um, oops, sorry about that. So, this is my last slide. Um, you can check it out at this um, URL. Uh, there will be elections in Germany in June, the European election in September, the general election, and um, you can check this out. And also, maybe you will be interested in how the Pirate Party uh, will do, and you will not see that probably in Spiegel Online, uh, but you will probably see it here. Thank you. Manfred, come please come to the stage. So. Braucht ihr die PowerPoint oder reicht auch PDF? Na dann mach. One, two, oh yeah. <laughs> Good evening. We would like to introduce to you the Netwatcher, a part of a free radios in a German language. Uh, but for all who does not understand German, I'm here uh, to tell uh, the people what is uh, with this camera there. Uh, there are cameras over there and over there uh, which are uh, filming us to the face for this. We have the black bars. Oh yeah, we have the black bars in front of our face because there are lots of cameras there for the live stream. This camera is for you, for your security. I hope you feel more comfortable and uh, secure because this camera faces you. Okay, thank you. It is of course not running, okay. So, let's talk about uh, NetWatcher and free radios. Yes, uh, we are from this... Okay, this talk will be in German because we're talking about uh, German language radio, free radio, radio NetWatcher. So, um, wir haben also in den letzten drei Jahren uh, jede Woche eine Sendung gemacht und haben also so einige Knacker in den Über... Uh, in den Schlagzeilen gehabt, die wir gemacht haben. In unserem äh, Radio geht es hauptsächlich eben, wie unten schon gesehen, um Privacy-Radio, hauptsächlich um gesellschaftliche Themen und dergleichen. Und die Dinge, die wir eben halt gemacht haben, ist, äh, der Manfred hatte ein Interview, als es ihn noch gab, äh, mit Jörg Haider gehabt. Und er hat sich dort ganz eindeutig gegen Überwachung ausgesprochen. Ein Schelm, wer Böses dabei denkt. Naja, und wie war das mit dem Richter, Manfred? Ja, vielleicht sollte man noch dazu sagen, wir haben alle Parteien natürlich befragt, kurz vor der Wahl. Und interessanterweise haben sich so manche Parteien, die sich als links oder links stehend ausgeben, bei den Bürgerrechten ziemlich taub oder sind schon im Liegen umgefallen. Ähm, wir können euch jetzt nur einen kleinen Ausschnitt in den wenigen Minuten geben, was wir schon in den 400, äh, bald 200 Sendungen gemacht haben. Das aktuellste Interview in der letzten Sendung war ein, ein gewisser Richter in Salzburger Landesgericht, betreibt eine Seite namens Internet for Jurists und wir haben über alles Mögliche gesprochen, auch über die Tierschützer und über § 278, aber die interessanteste Forderung ist von ihm, 
äh, erfordert die Imsi-Catcher unter Arrest. 